So good evening, and welcome to the uh, third in this year's uh, series of the Lonergan Workshop's response to the Church in the 21st Century Initiative uh, on the part of Father Leahy, our president. Uh, this evening's lecturer really doesn't need any introduction, so he's not going to get one. But, <laughs> but naturally, I have to talk a minute. Um, this, this weekend, I, I gave a talk in Toronto on grace and friendship. And this, is, this theme of friendship is a, is a great theme for uh, many people, especially one of my teachers, Gadamer, gave his inaugural lecture on friendship in Aristotle. And one of the things he says there, uh, he's talking about Aristotle's meaning of the true meaning of friendship, which is, which is a friendship uh, between equals uh, based on ex excellence. The Greek said excellence. And Gadamer was a very humane person. What Aristotle said that such friendships are rare. And he said, but what that means for the rest of us who are not excellent is that when we choose friends, we're always choosing a model for the excellence that we hope someday to attain because we see it in the objective, objective lovableness of those whom we want to be friends with. And actually, when I re first read that in Gadamer, I thought of becoming friends with Dave Tracy back in the North American College um, as a uh, raw, as a callow youth from California. I didn't suppose this would really be possible, but of course, with Dave, everything is possible, <laughs> including that. But he certainly was and has been a model for those of us who um, think we love God and hope to find out more about him. And so Dave is, of course, uh, as, as probably the most renowned Roman Catholic theologian in the States, is always asked to speak everywhere all the time. And I, am course, of course, am one who is constantly asking. And so I was so pleased when he said it would be possible for him to come here tonight. So I, I'm, it's a privilege and an honor once again to introduce Dave. I'm here, yeah? There's a mirror. <laughs> um, I'm very, very happy to be back at Boston College again, and especially sponsored by the Lonergan Institute, our mutual teacher, whose uh, work is continued through these lectures and through the Lonergan Center, and whose work to me is many aspects of it even more important than I w when I was young and enthusiastic. And I'm very thankful to Fred for that kind invitation and, of course, mutual friendship. Um, I'm especially, if I may say, uh, happy to see uh, so many people I've known over the years. And Fred is kind to say I lecture, but I stopped lecturing for a long time, for about 18 months. And um, uh, so I, I'm a little out of, uh, well, I've been for the last month or so. <laughs> um, but to many friends to, uh, that from here and that I see of Peter and Peggy and to Fred and Joe and Tom and Tom <laughs> and Javier and uh, really, so many that I've known over the years, and I'm very thankful for your coming. I hope it isn't a mistake. <laughs> when Fred asked me to speak in this series on the church, uh, especially in the context of the crisis of the last three years in our uh, American church and elsewhere, 
I, I was hesitant not because I don't care about it. I care deeply and I've been as traumatized as everyone else. But I've never, I'm sorry, you can't hear me. Is this better? Uh, I, I, I don't write, as a matter of fact, usually on the church. <laughs> but I'm God-obsessed and Christ-obsessed. So I'm a little nervous. I usually leave the church to my friends in ecclesiology, especially my old friend and uh, Joseph Kamanchek, whom I'm happy to say also lectured here. So if uh, it's a kind of mistake, uh, blame Fred. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll talk on God another time. <laughs> it does... Um, it seemed to me, however, that it, it was a welcome invitation insofar as uh, I think I have some things that may be useful to think about from a theological point of view, or at least one theologian's point of view, and partly because I, I think um, I've read a lot of the literature uh, in the last few years for various reasons on trauma and what happens in individuals and even cultures and communities who have been traumatized, and it seems to me a not inaccurate uh, word to use, uh, to the point where I find many of my friends saying, as Tolstoy famously said, very admirable man, uh, Jesus, yes, the church, no. Uh, and I, I don't agree, finally, with that as much as I admire and constantly read Tolstoy, because, as he later sort of admitted, he, too, learned about Jesus from his church, the Russian Orthodox Church, with which he, like we, have reasons at times to be quite justifiably angry. And when he learned Greek late in life, just to be able to read the New Testament in the original, in his gospel Christianity of his late life, wonderful, he eventually realized these texts originally called the apostolic writings or the text of those early communities of the church, that even our New Testament is that, and therefore um, we have to think, those of us uh, thus inclined, uh, about that. I do, however, before I read the lecture, wish to say also that I will be employing a very important distinction, traditional distinction in theology between church, which like Christ, or God, or grace, is a central theological affirmation of Christian belief, even I think for Tolstoy at the end. And for me here I mean by it a divinely empowered community where love and justice should reign so that when it doesn't, it's very painful for anyone in it. And I just always distinguish, like other theologians, and that's what I'll be talking of, too, in the title, of church from church order. That is to say, the particular order, structure, form, institutional form, that the church takes at a particular time in history, or that particular church, Christian churches take. There are, as you know, different church orders. Um, the Presbyterian, the Congregationalist, the Episcopalian, the Lutheran, the Quaker, and the Roman Catholic order of a pope and bishops and the rest of us. Um, and it's that that I'd like to uh, reflect upon. <coughs> My lecture has three parts, always. They. The first is on why I'm turning your attention and mine to what is now called early modernity, and I'm speaking of early Catholic modernity, like the great work of John O'Malley, um, rather than the Catholic counter-reformation of the 16th century, has really helpful in that crisis to perhaps help us think about our less, in fact, crucial crisis, but nevertheless very real one, and why I'm doing that, why I chose that as an entry. For one thing, I know a lot about that. And secondly, in the second part then of um, what difference that makes, and in the third part I'll make a few, I hope, practical proposals for certain suggested 
uh, changes in church order. Okay. We are creatures of desire and longing. We all of us long for justice and love, love if we are fortunate of another human being, if we are foolish, we let her or him go, and a community of love and justice or family. As well as, of course, philosophically and theologically for a universe in which we do not feel simply alone or abandoned, but that the universe may be, the reality rather itself may be, as many Christians hoped, itself the energy of love. As far as historical records go, human beings have always thus longed. But the equally intense record of the memory of the intense suffering over the ages can seem to give a lie to our longings. Love in a universe where millions have suffered unjustly. I refer not only to individuals, but to whole peoples, some of whose people's names and languages we no longer have. I have a student working on the Huron people, a great culture. There are only two people left in the entire world who speak Huron. And meaning in a universe where, unlike the ancients or the medievals, we do not feel, even in the ecological movement, I think, that kind of immediate participation in the cosmos that the ancients and the medievals felt. But since modernity, the period I'll speak about, we feel with Pascal the silence of infinite space at times, and it can terrify us. To be sure, we also experience, of course, joy, wonder, our lives with frequent moments of beauty, of goodness, and of meaning. And yet we long, we desire, we want. Our longings today, I suspect, in both state and church, and in relationship to the universe, are longings that are more haunted than they ever were before in Western history. Some even call our age an age of cynicism, but it should not be that. That's too lazy a response. For even those of us privileged ones in privileged Western cultures should be haunted by the frightening injustice of the life our life, and of others who do not have either the time or space, the money, or education to share our refined longings. Of those millions who have been colonized and enslaved, sometimes on behalf of our culture and our church. When longing, however, takes the form of nostalgia, as it often does, for some form of life in some misnamed golden age, as the romantics longed for their version of a mythic Middle Ages, as the Enlightenment philosophers longed for their version of the Roman Republic, as some Americans now long for what they think of as a more innocent America, but it was never innocent. Think of the native peoples and the slaves. And some wish a Catholic church in this country with the robustness and seeming innocence of our immigrant forebears. But as Walter Benjamin, that strange prophet of all self-deluding nostalgias, reminds us, there is in fact no innocent tradition. There is no innocent classic. There is no in innocent interpretation, including the one I give tonight. For in his just words, every great work of civilization is at the very same time a work of barbarism, of the peoples who have had to suffer to make our privileges possible. It is surely time then to drop nostalgia and try to see if one can refine such longings as Christians should eschatologically with using the resources of the past, but not nostalgically or romantically 
to try to think of where we might also go in the future. <coughs> For it is difficult often, very difficult I think, as Simone Weil reminds us, for moderns in our really too busy lives to try to be, as she said, what the ancients considered one of the great possibilities of life, to be genuinely attentive, to wait, to see, to be attentive as with her, to native longings for justice and beauty and the good beyond being, especially so in an age in which we suffer as our age nicely invents the word from overload, overload of demands and distinctions that life in this society inevitably and in many ways positively provides of diversions that even Pascal could not have envisaged. As one sociologist said, we are in danger of being entertained to death. A haunting sense that even our emancipatory moments may become either so traumatized that we reject them or with nostalgia so complacent that we rest in a way we should not rest or so cynical that we need not bother. <laughs> it's clear, I think, and I hardly need say in Boston, which has experienced even more intensely than the rest of us the recent traumatic events, but as also now with a new archbishop, seems to be doing very good things, with a group which I'm honored to have joined of the Voice of the Faithful some years ago, which I think is doing the sort of things I suggest theoretically at the end of my lecture in the third part. We uh, try to use all the resources of our tradition and our situation to try to render better. You can't, in trauma, you can't just move past it, but to do something to heal in the, our beloved Catholic Church, which many of us have experienced from childhood as a place that gave us justice and love and ideals and was all the more shocking, therefore, when the events occurred. For a principal meaning of the word Catholic, as you know, is universal. That is to say, it is a religion that goes across many cultures and generations, and it is never limited to one time or culture or group, or should not be. The Catholic Church is Catholic, I think, in both space and time, first space. And Catholicism is at the moment finally becoming not a European but a global church, as many have said, multicultural, crossing cultures, peoples, generations, individuals, classes. The nice thing about Catholicism is you can meet anyone, almost anywhere in the world, and be not surprised when they say, I'm a Catholic. So much is this the sense that many appeal to that odd but real Catholic James Joyce in his wonderful phrase for all that, it means here comes everybody. The scholarly world, I think, still awaits a book, which I encourage, <laughs> like in cultural anthropology, Clifford Goertz's splendid book, Islam Observed, on Islam across cultures from Indonesia all the way over to Morocco and now in Europe and here. We need a book, Catholicism Observed, to spell out this cultural Catholic fact for Catholicism, as cultural anthropologists will always remind theologians who may be a bit depressed, is in fact a strong and robust religion as a religion. If you want a religion, there it is. Its practices, its beliefs, its traditions, its spiritualities, its theologies, its memories, its hopes, its cultures, its peoples. Moreover, Catholicism, like contemporary Christianity of which it is a part, is no longer just a European religion, but has, I repeat, become increasingly a global one, just as there are now more Anglicans in Africa 
than in all of Great Britain, more Presbyterians in South Korea than in Scotland or the Netherlands. So too, statisticians tell us, in less than 15 years from now, there will be more Catholics, the largest group, over a billion. In the Southern Hemisphere, where especially in Africa, Catholicism is growing so strongly, than in the entire Northern Hemisphere, Europe, North America, and Northern Asia. This, as I repeat, an amazing fact that seems to suggest that the robustness of the strange religion continues. Of over a billion people, that with the other 500 million Christians, now in the ecumenical age, understood as our fellow Christians and fellow churches, is indeed an amazing reality, and then it grows. Catholicism is also not only Catholic in space, but also in time. A 2,000-year history where the memories of whole cultures and peoples of suffering, starting with Jesus of Nazareth, and hope of virtue and sin, of betrayal of the ideals and the ideals kept alive in figures we call saints or witnesses, is likely continue to continue to be deeply pluralistic when looked at realistically over history, even though they share, it can be shown, a certain central body of beliefs and practices and deeply <coughs> felt ideals. Catholicism, to recall Benjamin, like any great tradition, is, in the language I've used in books elsewhere, ambiguous. Some people think the word ambiguous is just negative. It is not. The word is used to suggest that you have to be able to spot and admit both the great good and evil, the truth and the falsehood, and religiously, the holy and the demonic that has occurred in this tradition as in all. I propose this evening to try to take just one of the periods in that time frame, principally the period now called early modernity of the 16th century and even earlier, a bit later too. I find it fascinating that historians of the period, many, now no longer refer to Catholicism in that period as they once did, as the Counter-Reformation. No longer refer to the period even as the time of the Renaissance and the Reformation, but as early modernity and early Catholic modernity involving both Catholic reform, having nothing to do with Counter-Reformation, and Catholic Counter-Reformation. For it is not to be forgotten that all the great Catholic reformers of the period like Ignatius Loyola, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Bartolome de las Casas, the Renaissance Catholic humanists in Italy, Philip Neri, the great new reform orders founded in the period, especially but not solely the Jesuits, the reform of ancient orders like the Carmelites by Teresa and John, or the Franciscans by the Capuchins, all of them played a crucial role first in reform. Ignatius, as far as we know, when he had his amazing visions and experience at Manresa or Teresa and John, barely knew of Protestantism, except that it was supposed to be bad and weren't that much interested in that. They were far more interested in understanding what had happened to them, not to Luther, and only later did they also join in the Counter-Reformation. <coughs> I think it's, that's not a bad thing, but my point is it didn't begin as one. The Reformation is occurring across all the traditions then. Of course, I don't pretend or want to romanticize early modernity either. It, too, is ambiguous. Both Protestant and Catholic, including the great reformers, 
were more than willing to engage in verbal violence towards one another. It was an age of great polemic, which very few did not engage in. Sometimes polemics are useful. Sometimes they, they are. Prophets tend to use them. Sometimes they're funny, as in Calvin's wonderful title, which all of us who write would be tempted to use one day to a critic. His title is simply, To a Certain Worthless Person. <laughs> Good title. The one witty moment in Calvin. <laughs> He was, <coughs> and of course it led to the religious wars that devastated Europe. A more ecumenical age, happily, does not usually engage in polemics, uh, but are willing to face that we indeed have, and the polemics could lead to violence, not just in word, but in action. However, there is still much in this period that is good and that reminds us of things that can be helpful now, I suggest. Early modern Catholicism reminds us, I think, I repeat, that the Catholic reform of these extraordinary religious geniuses, like an Ignatius of Loyola, or a Teresa, a Michelangelo, a Philip, a John of the Cross, or Talamo de las Casas fighting for the native peoples in this country, are peculiarly modern figures, all of them, as much as Luther or Calvin. They didn't think of it that way, but now one can see they are. Indeed, the very name Roman Catholic, as distinct from simply Catholic, emerges in this period. <coughs> I find this valuable, this emphasis in general on early modernity, not only Catholic early modernity, because the usual intellectual battles in our day of modernity and post-modernity seem to me very close to spent, especially since the model of modernity is almost always taken to be the 18th century Enlightenment pro and con, a period when pro and con, the uh, am amazing achievements and defects of modernity became hardened, reified, no longer fresh, just given to a new round of battles and polemics which continue even now. Because in early modernity, what one finds, including in Catholic early modernity, I suggest, is a time when everything was new about modernity. It was startling. It threw any decent mind or spirit asunder. One did not find out of the inflexible what can only be called not secular, but secularist, anti-Catholic and anti-Christian versions of modernity that you can find later in Laplace and others, nor the equally inflexible and useless anti-modern versions of 19th and early 20th century neo-scholasticism as the official version of Catholicism. It was not scholasticism ever. It was not the second scholasticism that emerged in the 16th century in Salamanca and elsewhere. It was this neo-scholasticism, this defensive, slightly pathetic attempt to attack modernity, which they specialized in, as Bernard Lonergan once said, in clear and distinct ideas and very few of them. <laughs> But that was never the scholastics or the second scholastics. <laughs> but it was them. As Skillebex has suggested, the irony of Catholicism in modern history is that at the Second Vatican Council, the official Catholic Church, individuals, of course, did before, embraced modernity at the very time when modernity began to distrust itself. It's a nice irony, I guess. <laughs> But it makes it all the more interesting that some begin to think of thinking again of early modernity, not just of the modern enlightenment in the 19th century, and so I suggest today. For the early moderns, whether they acknowledged it or not, all of them, experience what Louis Dupre in his wonderful book, A Passage to Modernity, has shown, 
that the ancient and medieval synthesis held no more. The synthesis that I would call, he does not, not merely an intellectual synthesis, but a felt synthesis. That one felt part of a community, one felt participatory in the cosmos. For like the ancients, was, the human being was not only a small cosmos or microcosmos and the macrocosmos, but for the Jew, the Christian, and the Muslim, human being was also imago dei, participatory immediately in the intelligence and love that was God. So that the cosmos, God, the self, community, they held together for thinkers like Thomas or before him, Aristotle, or any of them. They had this sense. The moderns did not and do not. Cosmos became nature. That is to say, not that in which we feel participatory, but that through the great developments of modern science and technology, we attempt to dominate, and must in a way, and feel with that extraordinary early modern whom I've already quoted, Pascal, that suddenly what his ancestors had felt themselves immediately participating in was now silent, and he felt afraid. It was no longer cosmos, it was nature. <coughs> and God could no longer be understood, especially through the great hints in human being as microcosmos and imago Dei, namely intelligence and love. Those two great hints that the ancients and the medievals could employ to understand God in relationship to cosmos, the self, as in Thomas or Bonaventure or Scotus, as a matter of fact, that no longer seemed quite possible either, at least the same way. Radical mystics returned, an Eckhart, a Perret. A John of the Cross discovered the dark night of the soul. The incomprehensible mystery of God and the Dionysian mystical traditions returned in figures like Kusa and many others, the 15th century. And at the very same time, a radical, hidden, radically hidden God, both fascinating and terrifying, comes forward in a new tragic sense in Western culture, in the Protestant Reformation of Luther and Calvin, and later among Catholics and Pascal and Racine and many others. <laughs> Above all, long before Descartes, in the next century, the self and the self's experience began to have to carry a great deal of weight it never carry, had to carry before in relationship to understanding not only itself, but cosmos and God. And all these early modern figures, all of them, always attempted to make sure the self's experience had something objective to keep it from going completely wild and astray with the church, as with the Catholic reformers, or in the case, I think amazing, like, like John of the Cross, a use of the new, the second scholasticism to reflect in very commentaries on his own poetry as this new song of songs for him, all the ancients commented on, a medieval spirit. <coughs> and to provide something like what Simon Weil justly calls a science of the mystical life. It was needed in a way it had not been previously. Or as Michel de Certeau shows, these people who were once just sort of normally religious in a society, perhaps a little more intense than the rest of us, Mystical was an adjective, not a noun, and now became a noun. A noun for these intense types who did no longer seem to fit. Teresa, Ignatius, John, they all had problems with the Inquisition. <laughs> <laughs> 
Martin Luther, Calvin, Minzer, they all had problems with how did they put together their intense experience of God as either incomprehensible mystically or hidden in Luther through the cross of Christ and the objective word or the objective church or the objective use of scholastic categories to understand what happens in the self as it goes through the dark night to some new experience of this incomprehensibly mysterious God. The return, I, in my view, of a tragic sense of the self, especially in the great Protestant reformers, Luther and Calvin, and later, I repeat, in figures, Catholic figures like Pascal, is also to be shown as present in a different way in the now more mysterious nature of the self than the medievals held, as in the Catholic skeptic Montaigne is his obsession for understanding himself, and only himself, because that was his only hope of understanding reality itself in the 16th century. Or I repeat, John of the Cross, or as I suggest later, of it, all the great artists, especially the one who lived through the whole series of events and was theologically deeply informed, Michelangelo. They seem to drive out an earlier Renaissance optimism and medieval serenity. A Renaissance optimism you can still see in the 16th century in Erasmus or Ficino or Della Mirandola or in the painter Raphael, who died early before it all collapsed, that optimism, <coughs> in favor of what is now very familiar and more troubled, a more alienated, a more dissentered self, and the self and its experience having to carry far more of the burden, even of understanding God and cosmos and the real than it ever did before. <coughs> It is for this reason, I think, that in the same period, faith, the very category, becomes so important as the category of the, of the Christian self's experience. Also, of course, the Jewish and the Muslim, very similar in the same period, the Jews especially. Faith becomes now especially a matter of radical trust in, loyalty to, God and the promises of God. It should not be, even Luther always says, with the most intense faith, like Kierkegaard later, also a Lutheran, it should not be the intensity of one's faith that counts so much, for it is only because God grounds that faith and God promised us in Christ and in the church, also for Luther, that the faith this intense experiential self makes great sense as a new way to understand reality. It is also so, I think, in the great Catholic mystics and reformers. It is still debated how much Ignatius of Loyola's extraordinary experiences at Manresa influenced even the writing of that most influential of books of the century and for centuries later, the spiritual exercises, or the very discovery of how to order a new religious order, the Jesuits. <coughs> the early moderns knew as much as a late or postmodern like us, and unlike these self-confident ones in the middle, that after one leaves one's mother's room, womb, one is born alone, one dies alone, one believes alone. Just as one's family, as a community, is there to help, or if one is fortunate in our medicalized age to die surrounded by one's family at home, as other peoples formerly did, we still die alone. 
And just as there is a church, a community, I repeat, empowered by the promise of God in Christ to give hope, love, faith, we are still in that moment alone in either having it or not. And it is never a personal achievement for either Catholic or Protestant. It is always a gift, a grace, something given and recognized as given, faith, which one feels, experiences, however transiently often for moderns. <laughs> Intensely, perhaps, and one tries to understand why and how so intense as John of the Cross or Teresa or Ignatius. Intensely, and one tries to use the scriptures and the word to keep it from getting to be only the self, as in Luther. Intensely, in all those figures, but always for all of them, the word and sacrament, to Christ, and this community, church, for all of them. There was no Tolstoy in the 16th century to say, Jesus, yes, the church, no. If they didn't like the church, they found it a new one. <laughs> but to receive it as gift, as grace, event, including church, I think they're right. Well, I like them. <laughs> and the Catholic reformers, <coughs> I think, did the same. And we too easily forget that they, mo mo practically all of them, had as many problems in their period with uh, unhappy institutions like the Inquisition, not one of the better moments of our tradition, as did uh, Protestants or Jews or Muslims who were caught by it. And the Christians, unfortunately, shared some unhappy things like an anti-Semitism. It was not a wonderful age. Except, of course, Teresa of Avila. She remembered her Jewish grandfather and her Jewish father and how they were dragged before the Inquisition and barely survived. And when she was dragged, the threat that she was half Jewish was always there and she knew it. But she charmed them. The enormous power, I think, of the Catholic Reformation and what became the Counter-Reformation, but it's the Catholic Reformation of early modernity it does help to understand another period when intellectually, and not just because of this crisis, but even intellectually more generally, uh, the same kinds of uh, unsteadiness, confusion uh, is there. Martin Luther was, by my account at least, and by most, like Loyola or Teresa or John, an original religious genius, a useful category, not a talent, a genius. In a century of religious geniuses, he was also, I think, clearly a prophet, a prophetic figure, denouncing, as did other prophets of the period, like Savonarola, real abuses and promoting God's justice and love he always saw, as far as I can see, and like Calvin, say, who saw history through the category of covenant, even in New England they came and established a new covenant, these Calvinists, who made our culture possible. But for Luther it was always a series of interruptions and terrors, of apocalyptic, as it was for Savonarola and many others in that period, as it became for the radical reformers like Thomas Münzer, as it became in all the apocalyptic movements which had an intensity that is almost hard to understand now. As far as I can see, to use a water metaphor, the mainstream of Christianity when it becomes in trouble, when it comes into deep trouble and crisis in different periods, two whirlpools show up marginal and forgotten traditions usually. One is the mystics of the most radical love and intellectual sorts. The other is the apocalyptic. So it was with the early spiritual Franciscans or before them of Joachim of Fiore, 
or the end of the whole New Testament, the book of Revelation, or the middle of Mark's gospel. <coughs> Mark himself, I think. And so it was, I think, for many in this period. I'm going to skip some. Um, so that we can go on to a second section. Um, uh, the Council of Trent from 1545 to 1563, a rather long period, that didn't meet all the time, as you know. And I was thinking that's from the end of World War II to the assassination of John Kennedy. That's a long time if you live through it. Um, the Council of Trent, and I think, has been much misunderstood in many ways, but I only mention one because I like it. <laughs> it was a great reforming council. It reformed not only the abuses in the church that everyone, Catholic and Protestant, were not by now screaming against, emperors and popes, even at times the courier, all. And it was a great doctrinal council. What fascinates me about it is the fight they had to decide what they would even do was it to be only a reform of abuse councils like only a century, actually less, to end at 1517, the Fifth Lateran, useless. They would never change, they would never reform. Or did it have to take on this central issue of justification in their language, what I'm calling here, it involves, of course, justification and sanctification in the language, theological language, faith and the experience of the self the, ref the major figures there knew it had to. They finally convinced the emperor, a very decent man, Charles V, I think, to calm down. They would reform the abuses. They would have two sessions going at once or two committees, one on the doctrines that needed, especially on what is justification, faith, and later sacraments, the latter part, and one on the reforms of bishops, of seminaries, of priests, etc. And the fact is, it's so looked down upon today, I find, but it, I find it a council far more like Vatican II, a reforming council, a pastoral council, but more than Vatican II, also a doctrinal, theological council, and not like Vatican I, an apologetic and defensive council. <laughs> I do not, of course, claim, in spite of the, or, I, or I'm happy with the Lutheran Roman Catholic saying that justification is no longer a problem between us. There are differences, but they shouldn't make uh, great differences. Uh, that's probably right, but the 16th century didn't think so. They thought it did. And one of the differences, of course, and it's important to see with the Catholic reform, is that Luther, uh, uh, the Catholic reformers, not just Trent, all of them, assumed that if you could get right on justification and sanctification, if you could get right on how, ho how after faith, again through grace, holiness might be pursued as an Ignatius or Teresa or John, you need not worry about changing or developing a new church order. Just reform the present one of its abuses. Luther, of course, originally hoped for the same thing. He was driven both by the response to his extraordinary insight into justification, which now most Christians share, that it's always gift, it's never achievement, it's never work. Um, he said he would even take a pope if he would agree with that, which was a big for Luther. He was driven by that, by his opponents, and also by what can only be called, if you put it positively, his prophetic temperament. If you put it negatively, as is also true, he too is ambiguous, he was out of control whenever he disagreed with anyone. <laughs> The Jews were fine. He was a philo-Semite because once they heard the true gospel, not this papal nonsense, 
they would become Christians. Well, they didn't. And he went insane in an anti-Semitism that is shocking even for that age. The peasants revolt, they thought, through his, his principles partly, he opposed them. The popes rejected him. At first, he dedicates his works to them. By the end, they've become the Antichrist. It's a difficult character, but pro prophets tend to be there. Very different from Calvin, that lawyer, that rhetorician, that humanist. He wanted to order a new church, and he did very well. Luther never did. He was driven to develop a new church order. And then, here we all are. The Catholics, now Roman Catholics, said the present church order works. It has for 1,600 years. It needs reform, always reform, but it works. I'm with them, obviously, I'm Catholic. <laughs> well, you don't have to be with them if you're Catholic, I guess. <laughs> but I am. I think, uh, if I thought Luther's way, I would be driven Luther's way. The <coughs> it is, of course, true, as many as historians show of you, everyone knows it, there wasn't in what we call a pope for three and a half centuries the first papal primacy. Pope is probably Leo the Great in the fourth century, others before. It was the Bishop of Rome. The Petrine ministry, that terribly important ministry from the New Testament to this day to try to provide unity to this extraordinary collection of different spiritualities, theologies, persons, cultures, etc. And then, since then, for Roman Catholics, including me, a pope doesn't trouble me at all. And they didn't, by the way, in spite of my friend, and he is my good friend, Gary Wills, they didn't just sin. <laughs> they were, like everything else, ambiguous. They did some quite good things, like Gregory the Great, or many of them. And they did some quite awful things. Some of them were corrupt, or both, simul justus et peccato, or some of them very stupid in their decisions, even some of the rather decent ones. Paul IV, the great reformer, a disaster. Ignatius at Lowe's last years are miserable because of that thug. The statues, have, you, have to clo you have to clothe Michelangelo's nude paintings. You have to, can't have a council because he'll do all the reforms. Practically ended everything. <laughs> and he was a reformer. He was a good person. But not helpful policies. As Belloc, very Catholic, said, Sometimes you read their policies and you think it must be a divine institution. For no mere human institution governed by such knavish imbecility would have lasted a fortnight. <laughs> uh, well, I'll leave out the second part. You'll be happy to hear. And, uh, and go to uh, a couple of suggestions. <laughs> may be useful, if not blame Fred. <laughs> uh, th that's, I think, mainly what I might be able to add as a theologian who is obsessed by faith and self and God and grace and all that to the discussion. And it's very important to remember. If one moves immediately to church order questions, where are we? The 16th century knew you were nowhere, <laughs> all of them, whether they wanted to change the church order or not. It seems to me, or at least I suggest, that maybe the people are right that all we need to do is to reform the abuses. Maybe. I suspect maybe we need to do uh, uh, some reforms with the way the institution works, the church order, and that's what I'll end with. Yeah. On the church order, not on church, remember. <laughs> uh, could not Catholics who are realistic about the history, and should be, and about its ambiguity, its plurality, its greatness, its terror at times, <coughs> its strength, its foolishness. 
Could they not also see that even the papacy has been different in different periods, wise and foolish, etc., different forms, different institutional forms? All of them, major institutions have been councils. Think of the difference between Const the Council of Constance and, Fla and Basel, where it says that the council is over the pope and accepted by the pope, and later councils, Vatican I. Or the role of councils, the role of bishops, the role of laity, above all, the role of women. Uh, it, it is a, t a tradition that in church order, which I repeat is partly, in my opinion, theological, church. And if it's a church, as I described it, a community of hope, love, and lo uh, faith, hope, love, and justice, empowered by the promise of God in Jesus Christ as a gracious God. It's my little union church. There's always some order. There's not an individual, that's a community. The question is, what's a good order? And in the New Testament, as far as I can see, you can find all these church orders of present-day Christianity, just as you can find all the spiritualities of present-day Christianity. So I don't see how you know, the, the 16th century saying, oh, the, the scripture decides, on this issue, the scripture does decide on some. On this, you better find it in the scripture, <laughs> the New Testament, but you can find Presbyterianism, you can find Congregationalism, you can find Quakers, you can find Pentecostals, you can find Episcopalians, and you can find the Petrine ministry and Roman Catholicism and the bishop. It's history later, <laughs> it's church order. You know, and, and all the models, like Bellarmine on using the political theory of his period of perfect society. The problem today, Kamanchuk is right in ecclesiology, as far as I can see as a non-ecclesiologist. Yes, we have new images like people of God and pilgrim people, but we don't have a social theory adequate for it. We don't have a political theory adequate for it. Vatican II was great, but it didn't develop as the earlier Bellarmine and the did, right? or even mystical body lent itself earlier to a particular organ, organist, organic theory. As in, okay. Okay, what changes might occur if collegiality, the pr basic principle of Vatican II, remember you know it was that Vatican I ended abruptly because Louis Napo or Napoleon III withdrew his troops from, from Rome because he's attacked, he's fighting the Prussians, which he lost, and the bishops go home. They were going to discuss the bishops. Vatican II, as Vatican II, was partly, not only, it did lots of other things, meant as a completion of that. Thus, the first decree is on the church in Lumen Gentium, uh, I'm sorry, no, not Lumen Gentium, of collegiality as the principle of the bishop and the popes. I think it's an awfully good principle and a very Catholic one. <laughs> It's a principle as solidarity of all of us. The Pope, I think, would still, for Roman Catholics, have all the authority that the Pope in history has come having, but would also always have something like a permanent Episcopal Synod, and not only Episcopal, but the heads of religious orders, male and female. And the Curia would be responsible, as they already are, to the Pope, and also to such a synod in terms of collegiality. So that the synods would not, they had not been very successful, because someone else sets the agenda, they seem to show up and do sometimes very helpful things. But if, if there was such a body, it seems to me that the issues that plague us, like should priests be married, I'd be willing to make the argument to the Senate, yes. Should women be priests? How are we going to discuss these issues if there isn't such an institutional form all the way across the Catholic community, I think. <coughs> Same with the bishops on the Episcopal level. Does anyone really doubt, uh, maybe I'm wrong, 
That if 25 years ago, lay people, especially parents, were on the boards for appointing priests to different parishes, that this horror could ever have happened? Is that not a helpful, I mean, it's horror, but could it not be a moment to say, maybe systemically this could all be improved, not just occasionally, with reform the abuse, maybe on the Episcopal, on the, para, on the diocesan level too, it would be good to have collegiality of such a board for decision-making. The bishop does make the decision finally, as the pope does finally for Roman Catholics, but it doesn't have to be so alone <laughs> in it, if you had such a body. This is not, you notice, conciliarism. That's why I think it's sort of interesting. It's not, though I know many will think of it, Protestantism. No Protestant would accept this. None of those orders would, starting with popes, <laughs> which this is. And it's not really, though, I mean, I've suggested it, oh, you're an American, you're a Democrat. It actually isn't that either. First of all, I don't think American democracy is working all that well at the moment, that it should be some great ideal. But in fact, it's trying to take the church order of the Catholicism that in the early modern period becomes Roman Catholicism and then develops including in the declaration of papal primacy in Vatican I and collegiality in Vatican II, and try to say, structurally, what might this mean? That's all. As far as I can see on the parish level, it already does, or at least should, operate with the role of parish councils. That seems to be where it's operating best. <laughs> well. In the meantime, I repeat my basic point. Even if these suggestions on church order are useful or not, they're just suggestions for the community, and maybe someday they'll be useful to someone who can do something about them. I can't at the moment. <laughs> uh, we don't have such a way to discuss these issues. That's the problem. Um, but even if that's the case, it doesn't change an affirmation, I repeat, a theological affirmation of church any more than of Christ or of God. But it does say church order has changed in history, can change. You don't need a new one in my judgment. And at the same time, why not take advantage of thoughts from Vatican to itself with collegiality of how you might rethink the one we have and I'm happy to have. Though it is, as Vatican II said, not a pyramid, Pope, bishops, laity, it's concentric circles. It's very important to remember that. And each of the circles you have are related to the other circles, especially through something like a permanent synod, something like a permanent diocesan board, something like a parish council. If it's a pyramid, it's not that. In other words, what I want to say in conclusion is that may or may not be useful. I hope so, but I'm not sure. Um, for church order issues, we have to have a way to discuss these issues or we're going to tear ourselves apart. I mean, as a community, it's, I don't mean just the crisis. I mean women priests, uh, celibacy, uh, contraception, liturgical changes. I mean, I don't see how, we, uh, and you don't have to become, quote, as if that's an evil thing, which it isn't Protestant or democratic to accept these. As far as I can see, anyone, conservative, moderate, progressive, could accept such a framework and say, then how do you work it out? And that's what we need, not just to keep hitting at one another. <laughs> well, but above all, I hope, I may have helped <laughs> to say that theologically at least, we, it becomes an occasion also to really understand what faith is, as I've suggested, as in the 16th century, when we can no longer have the security, the serenity that was once present. And where are we? We're only somewhere, if we understand, that faith is gift, 
That church is part of that gift is the community of justice, love, hope, faith, empowered by the promise of God in Christ Jesus, and therefore fully theological, as did Luther or Calvin, in spite of their developing new church orders, as did Teresa or John or Ignatius, in spite of insisting, as I do, the present church order is just fine. Maybe we could make it better. But it is not, of course, that you have to go back to the 16th century to find such witnesses. We have them, too. A Dorothy Day, a Teresa of Calcutta, a Bernd Lonergan, a Pedro Arupe. And it should not only be Catholics, these witnesses, of course a Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Martin Luther King Jr., a John the 23rd, a John Paul II. All these figures, as much as the figures of the 17th century, can help one to understand what faith working through love and justice in very different ways, sometimes in conflicting ways, might involve. But let me end with the one I mentioned but didn't develop, since to me he's the most powerful in the 16th century, Michelangelo. The Catholic theologians of that period, as far as I can see, as distinct from the great Catholic artists, artists, the mystics, and the founders of religious orders of the period, weren't much. They were mainly commentators and commentators. But it didn't matter. It's embarrassing for theologians to think this, but it didn't matter that much. The religion isn't saved by theology. There have been periods when it hasn't had a very good one officially. But what they had was more than enough. And they were all informed theologically to various degrees. John of the Cross, deeply. Ignatius, enough. <laughs> Teresa, enough. I mean, she wasn't allowed to be educated. Uh, and Ignatius was very late, and he's running around to do it. Michelangelo, Michelangelo, and then his successors, Lanyas and Borgia and so forth, very well. Right? Uh, Michelangelo, very well, as a matter of fact, which is why he fasted. He knew theology, and he had great theological advisors. For example, all the books on the Sistine Chaplain who advised him. So let me suggest that maybe he helps to see his career and think of the theology and the great art. I presume you have some of the images in mind that I'll mention. His early work is very optimistic, like the Renaissance Catholic humanism it was, or like Raphael, or like Vatican II, or the early 60s. It all seemed it couldn't go wrong. It's going very well. Look at the David, how beautiful how the classical world and the Christian world really harmonize. Look at the sorrow of Mary in the Pietà, how moving, but it doesn't tear you apart like later works will. Moving, melancholy, not tragic. And then it all happens. Christianity tears itself apart Rome, where he is living, is sacked by the emperor and the Lutheran troops, terribly sacked. It was an awful sacking of Rome. I mean, they were sacked many times. This was it. I mean, every woman is raped, every cardinal is tortured, every, the pope just makes it into the Castel San Angelo. It's a t and Michelangelo sees all this. And he's also part, by the way, of a reforming group in Rome, a rather quiet group led by the that great woman Victoria Colonna, herself an amazing theologian, and such reforming theologians, later influential in Trent, as Seripando, and Cervini, and Cantarini. Well, Michelangelo, who is il terribile, of course, he, he, he's aware both of the need for such, not just of the abuses, notice. That doesn't interest me too much. Everyone who's not an idiot knows that of reforming the understanding of the self and of faith without leaving the great tradition. But it becomes different. Even the Sistine ceiling, it's already happening. It's both the creation and the fall. <laughs>
and intensely depicted and felt and theologically understood, if you read the books and what he's reading, or his great statue of Moses, his own favorite work, Freud's favorite work, Freud would always rush to Rome and rush immediately to the statue of Moses, its strength, its passion, its fury at what was going on. And then, of course, in the same room, The Last Judgment, painted much later after the sack of Rome, after the Reformation has split all, after his own earlier optimistic hopes have been smashed, perhaps. His theology and religion is very helpful, at least for any who lived through the optimism of Vatican II and the Kennedy years here, and now face both a church and a state hardly to be applauded, or hardly to be optimistic in the moment. This is in the long run. And to traumas as bad in ways as the sack of Rome, certainly for the victims, Bad for all of us, bad especially, I think, for the victims above all, their families above all. And I think people forget for parish priests, overstaffed, underworked, I'm sorry, overworked, understaffed. And there's not going to be a new staffing, it would seem. All as gray as I am. And demoralized also by a trauma, which means that persons who once were trusted now are not by many. Well, Michelangelo too felt this trauma. Even Paul III, that last of the Renaissance popes who found, who founds, uh, he knows he has to reform in doctrine too, Trent, great paintings of Paul by Titian, he knows it has to happen, and when he sees the Last Judgment, knowing what his life has been as a Renaissance prince, all those nephews as cardinals at 20 and so forth, <coughs> he falls to his knees and repents and actually reforms and makes Trent possible and joins, keeps appointing more and more reformers. Well. Perhaps it is helpful, as I suggest, but this is only one time, I repeat, in this Catholic tradition in time and space, and maybe not the best. But so I suggest is one, <coughs> because on the positive side, one can think it out again. On the negative, one is thinking it out in a time that is very difficult, even traumatic, like Michelangelo's at the end, not at the beginning. So that perhaps we, like the last, after the last judgment works of Michelangelo, will remain as many postmoderns teach us, like Michelangelo's last works, the great unfinished sculptures, incomplete, unfinished, but perhaps even more moving than all the others.